Some of the benefits of homebrewing your own D&D campaign include honing your storytelling skills, uh, cultivating your innate creativity, uh, expanding your knowledge of the greatest game ever invented. But by far the greatest thing is when you've created a world in which players, whether they're your friends around a table or strangers over the internet, can spend three or four hours in and have fun. You know it when you see it, and nothing makes the hours you've spent preparing for that run better when your players are all having fun. And today I'm going to give you five tips on how you can make that happen. Hey all, it's K.R. King again, uh, setting out here to help you homebrew your own campaign one video at a time. As I've said many times, the ultimate goal in playing D&D is to have fun, and when you're not, whether as a GM or a player, all the other benefits pale in comparison. Now as a GM, I can tell you there are players that you can't have fun with, can't play with them, and you know, some are redeemable, but some just aren't. We've all met them, uh, and now that we're playing online, we're seeing them a lot more. But if you've got a good group of players, committed to playing in your world, committed to investing themselves, and you're not having fun, then you gotta look at yourself. Because you control the world and how it proceeds. You can make that world fun much more easily than the players. So I found that there are some key steps that you can take and monitor to ensure that you and your players are always having fun. Oh, and again, if you like the channel, please subscribe. All right, so my number one key is at the very beginning of the campaign to explain your world the ethos of it, how the game is going to go, and then be consistent. So at session zero, you tell the players what style of play that you're going to do, uh, how the various classes are considered in this world. You're also going to explain how you're going to level up, how you're going to give out treasure, and again, you're going to be consistent throughout. So let's say you're going to play heroic fantasy, in which all the players basically are lawful good, and they want to protect the weak and punish the evil. And also perhaps certain classes uh, and even races uh, have difficulties in this world. Now, if you've got a group of friends that you've played with for years, they know your style of game, and they're going to be okay with that. But again, people leave the game. Sometimes you have new people come in, and you may have a problem with them if they don't like this style. And then on the internet, you're constantly going to get people that say, oh yeah, I'm okay with that, and then start to do things that violate the ethos of the game. And the other players in your game will watch to see how you respond to this. And if you let players get away with bad behavior, with doing things that you said is not in the spirit of the game you're playing, they're going to notice that. And the players that are following the rules can get a little bit resentful. So, for example, I was recently playing online in a world in which uh, the GM had said, you know, we have an ethos of one for all and all for one and everything. We got into a battle and one player was left standing. The rest of us had been out, we were unconscious. So you had one character left standing and he proceeded to loot the treasure from the defeated opponent and not tell anyone. But of course, we were there, we were watching this you know, meta game and, and we saw this and the GM didn't do anything about it. So now we're all messaging each other online. Can you believe this guy's doing this, whatever? Because again, we're online, we don't really know each other. Then we get back to town, the guy takes the uh, treasure that he couldn't use, that some of us could use, the magic items, he sells them for all sorts of gold and gets all sorts of stuff. Again, the GM says nothing. Now, in terms of the overall game, it was kind of a minor thing. The, the, the game was pretty good. And in fact, the guy, after a couple more sessions, his work hours changed and he left the game. But I remember thinking, you're not being consistent in the ethos that you told us this game was. Okay, number two is to explain how the players and GM are going to treat each other in real life and in terms of their characters and the NPCs in the game. And then again, be consistent with this. No abusive language, no sexual harassment, uh, no racism, no torture, uh, nothing evil either to the players or about the players or whatever. Now you might be saying, oh, wait a minute, should this be rule number one, not just the ethos of the world? Well, it can be if that's the way you want to do it. One of the things is if you're going to run a dark fantasy world in which, you know, bad behavior is maybe not encouraged but accepted, uh, you're going to have to establish that first and then bring this in. But by the way, in real life we're doing this and there are limits in this dark fantasy world. And again, if you have a violation, players not treating each other well or doing things in the world that violate these norms, you need to come down calmly but forcefully. So if you've got a bunch of old friends playing at a tabletop game, probably not a problem, but sometimes you have people that want to tell jokes or do things that 
they don't realize are inappropriate. And you'll have players that maybe don't want to respond to this or they, they feel embarrassed or something. You as the GM need to go, hey, no more of those kind of jokes. That's not how we play this game. And then if you've established sort of a dark fantasy game and you've got someone on the internet that thinks, oh, I get to do all this nasty stuff and everything, you just say, hey, that's not how we're playing this game. Uh, these are the rules. And if they don't like it and they want to quit, God love them. Let them play in some other game. And I've had to apply this rule maybe, you know, a handful of times. I had one guy one time who said, screw you. He got pissed off and he quit. Good riddance. And every other time the person was just like, oh, oh, wait, did I do something wrong? And they realized it and they said, oh, no problem. And we moved on and we had no problem. Remember, you're the GM. It's your world and you put all this work into it. So I say run your world like an old school dad. My house, my rules. All right, rule number three is to keep things moving. Nothing is more deadly dull than a game that bogs down in endless role playing or battles that go on for hours and hours or being stuck at a puzzle that you can't figure out, you can't go forward, you can't go backward, or when you're fumbling around with your notes or the players didn't go in the direction you thought and everyone is waiting for you to figure things out. You have to remember that your players are investing their valuable time to play in your world. There are other things they could spend their time on and there are other campaigns they could run in. Be ready to play and be conscious of how long things are taking and have things ready to go if the players aren't sure of what to do next. Think of creative ways to introduce new storylines. You know, the players witness a, a fight in the street or a, a mysterious uh, preacher from some cult at a corner or an old friend shows up and needs help. Just have two or three of these options ready if the players look like, oh, we don't really know what we're supposed to do now, and then introduce them when they make a decision, you go. Now, downtime is important. It lends realism to the game. It lets the players breathe a little bit and think about their characters and prepare. But a lot of it you want to do offline. If you're spending hours doing downtime activities, it can get boring. And don't fall into that trap of having a player who constantly wants to role play so that they can vamp it up with their funny voice and they're gonna interact with every person in the tavern or in your city and they're gonna think of all these things that they might have done as a character. Here's the thing, there might be some players that think this is hilarious. Oh my gosh, we're having so much fun. I guarantee you there's gonna be two or three players that are just like, well, what is happening here? Why is this person dominating? Now, battles have sped up considerably in 5e from some of the slog fests we used to get involved in in 3.5 and 4. But you still can get some battles in which you're, you know, hacking and slashing at different monsters and they just keep coming and coming and you've got clerics that are healing people up, but you've run out of spells, so you just have to hack and slash. And it goes on and on and on. And I was in one of these recently on an online campaign and it was a random encounter that didn't mean anything, right? And so it didn't, you know, forward the storyline. There was no treasure involved and we spent like two hours of game time. So unless it's a critical battle that's going to be moving the storyline along, make sure you move quickly. Rule number four is players must advance and they must find treasure, i.e. magic. But you've got to do this in a way that doesn't unbalance the game. Throughout this series, I've emphasized storytelling. I talk about it's the motivations and desires of the NPCs and the characters that motivates the stories. It isn't just hacking and slashing. Because you don't want a campaign of endless, unconnected battles in which the players don't feel invested in the world. They have no connection. They don't really know what's happening. But having said that, remember what a famous guru of the 19th century, he came and visited England, and they asked him if there was any one truth in all his travels that he knew. And he said, well, I've, I've gone over the world. I've met people from all the nations, all different classes. And I can tell you one thing that I've noticed in common among all peoples. They are greedy. And in D&D, &D, levels and treasure are like money. Generally, people cannot get enough of it. Now, if you give a person unearned rewards, let's say they win a lottery, oftentimes this ruins their life. But if they're working in a job and they never get a raise, no matter how much they like the work, they're going to leave. They're going to say this isn't worth it. So you have to decide how you're going to hand out experience, whether it's the challenge rating of the monsters, you know, whether it's story markers, uh, whether it's role-playing stuff or, you know, inspiration or things that the players do. But if it takes 10 four-hour sessions to go up one level, the players aren't going to like that. And if they get to 20th level after 10 four-hour sessions, that's a little fast. They didn't really earn that. 
Now, you can look this up, and there's many different theories. I'm not going to go into those, but, you know, somewhere in between what I just described. Uh, again, you just want to balance this. You want to think about how I'm doing this and make it so that it, it's kind of a consistent pattern in terms of how long you're playing. Because that way players will see, oh, okay, I can make these levels, but I'm also breathing in the world. I'm having the storylines evolve, and things are happening. Now, as for magic, you know, you have the attunement rules in 5e, which I think are designed so that players can only use so many items at once. You don't get into some money hall thing where they got 38 magic items. On the other hand, players read the books. They see all these incredible items, these miss magic things and all this stuff, and they want to use them. So you can be creative in terms of handing out some items without unbalancing the world. You can have a limited number of uses, and then they, they go dead. You know, wands that run out and can't be recharged rings, this sort of thing. The point is we all want to run into a deck of many things, at least once in a campaign. And you can be creative. You can have a wheel or something that turns. You can have picture frames in which, you know, you pick one and turn it or whatever. And as long as you tell the players there's going to be war wheel, if you do these things, the excitement level of one of those is great. So don't deny yourself the fun of treasure. Just try to balance it so that it doesn't turn into a ridiculous money hall thing. And the fifth rule, which really covers all of them, is to play fairly. You must be fair with all your players. You must trust them to be fair with each other and with you. And you must be consistent in your fairness. You cannot play favorites. The other players will quickly realize this. They will resent it. Uh, it can really poison your campaign. You know, and if you're mad at a player about what they're doing, tell them, uh, maybe offline, uh, but treat them fairly in the game. Uh, the only reason usually they'll leave on their own if they don't like the style or if they're going to violate rule number two. But again, if you apply it fairly without taking that resentment, maybe they play in a style you don't like or, you know, they have a view of the game you don't like. Uh, take that out of it. Take your personal feelings out of it and try to treat everybody fairly like you'd want to be treated. When you hand out inspiration, if you give bonus experience for role playing uh, in terms of handing out you know, magic items that apply to one class or another. Really think about being fair. If you can truly learn to treat your players the same, whether it's your oldest friend or someone you just met online, your players will see that and they will respect you as a GM and they will go along with the events and storylines of your world without complaint. But if they suspect that you play favorites and you don't play fair, they won't respect your world. They'll know it's a game like life, rigged for the people with connections. Part of the reason we play D&D is to escape that world. So again, please subscribe to my channel. Leave some comments, some of the basic rules you may have as a GM. Maybe some stories about how things didn't work out so well. In the meantime, keep playing D&D, my friends, and tell somebody else about it.